Hi, my name's Fred Zelt. I'm a geologist and cyclist living in Pittsburgh, and I'd like to share with you a talk about the geologic background of three great bike trails in Western Pennsylvania, each a unique trail and in a unique part of the state and the country. So let me share my screen here and get us going. Okay, so this is about the uh, Conema Watershed Uplands, the Conema Uplands um, in Indiana and Cambria County, three trails that we'll cover here. These trails will be part of uh, excursions, uh, 22 and 22 series, uh, hosted by Venture Outdoors and Earth Science Excursions. And I'm recording this in early May of 2022. Here's a list of the 25 major bike trails in Western Pennsylvania and adjacent states, each longer than 10 miles. And the three that we'll be covering here are highlighted in orange. Um, you can see on the map uh, example access points for these. And the map itself is a color uh, ed elevation map of Western Pennsylvania and adjacent states with red being high and green being low. We'll see a whole series of maps like that. So there are the 22 and 22 trails. And then the ones with W's are part of the wilds weekend uh, in the Pennsylvania wilds. So 25 trails in all. And those 25 trails I've arranged into six themes. I'm uh, creating a geology theme talk on each one. I've already recorded and shared on YouTube the talks for the Allegheny and Ohio River Valley circled in blue. The low plateau talk uh, with the black outline includes several trails. This one, the Connemont Uplands in orange. The next one I'll make is the Lower Highlands. Each of these, because there's a different uh, geology of that area, each of these has a different theme. So I try not to repeat too much content between them. Um, and so part of the, what I'll talk about here will be abbreviated because I'll expand on that when I talk about the highlands. Um, also, I'll mention that um, we're not sharing these videos uh, publicly to try to sell trips. Uh, these trips are all pretty much booked up. So that's not the purpose of this. The purpose of this is to help people realize how many great bike paths there are in this region uh, that you can get out and explore and to share a bit about the relation between the geology and the landscapes to help people better appreciate uh, the, the uh, area around them and a bit of its history too. The three bike trails in this theme are the Hootlebug Trail in Indiana County, which is actually on the edge of the low plateau. So the low plateau is talk, talk is relevant for that one too, but it has a lot of ties to the Ghost Town Trail, Path of the Flood Trail that are, they're all in the Connemaw watershed and they have a, some similarities uh, within this little area. Um, and also they're each really unique. Uh, and we'll talk about each one and, and these uh, kind of unique names for each one. A little more background about the area. And, and some things beyond the parts of trails that we'll talk about. This is a great map of recreational opportunities in this area put out by the Connemaw Valley Conservancy. And in uh, dark red are the bike paths. You can see the West Penn Trail here to the west um, uh, around Salzburg. And uh, that's a, one of the 22 and 22 bike trails, uh, this part of it that's circled. Um, and that was covered in the plateau talk. So it doesn't have as big of a bubble around it as these three that are the focus of this talk. This talk includes, as I mentioned, the Hootlebug Trail in Indiana County, the middle part of the Ghost Town Trail, not the whole trail, and all of the path of the Flood Trail uh, going down to Johnstown. But there are a lot of other recreational resources in the area. So the objective is to provide background on this area, the geology and, and how that relates to the landscapes and the three special bike trails here by giving a regional context, talking about what's special about the trails, and then uh, digging into some of the local features of uh, interest or importance. I'll talk about the Pennsylvania Canal, a little bit about the Pennsylvania Railroad that came through here, and then coal was really important in this region, coal mining. Uh, the Johnstown flood is a feature too, uh, the path of the flood trail. And then at the end, um, I'll have a slide or two on each of the trails specifically. We'll start off with this regional elevation map, the higher areas in red, lower areas in green. And I'm not gonna get into a lot of detail of the, about the relationship between geology and landscapes here 
because I plan to do that um, in more detail in the talk about the Laurel Highlands just to the south of this area. But I would like to point out that across Pennsylvania, the rocks, at the bedrock near the surface here is hundreds of millions of years old. Um, so it's been deeply buried here in Pittsburgh, typically buried 8,000 feet deep in southeastern Pennsylvania. Many of the rocks here are metamorphic, uh, recrystallized rocks because they were buried so deeply in the Piedmont of Virginia up into through Maryland into Pennsylvania, or igneous rocks that are crystalline that um, were uh, formed uh, 3, 30,000 feet deep or, long, or more, and that were thrust up by a continental scale collision between part of Africa and North America that grew a mountain belt here, uh, once as high as the Andes, now worn down to its roots. So these rocks were really deeply buried, um, less deeply buried. Um, and uh, this part of the bedrock is uh, sedimentary uh, rocks. And here, the sedimentary rock layers, which are hard rock because they were deeply buried for a long time, um, they've been intensely folded, tilted up on end. So the ridges here are uh, sandstones resistant to erosion, and the valleys are shales and limestones that aren't so resistant. So you can see the geology and the shape of the landscapes here. And you can see that all through the Appalachians in this valley and ridge of Ridge and Valley province. That style of landscape and geology uh, changes right here along the Allegheny Front. And to the west, we're in the plateau. This is the low plateau. There are some broad folds, but they're not very visible at this view, typically hundreds of feet high. But in the high part of the plateau, there are long ridges here held up by quartz rich sandstones resistant to erosion with long valleys in between. You can actually see the folds uh, in front of the intensely deformed part of the fold belt formed by compression between these continents as they collided. So there's a high part of the plateau and a low part of the plateau. And those geologic elements and landscape elements are regional in scale because they come from this continental scale collision. And again, we'll have more details about this in the Highlands talk and the relation between this and the geology. But this is our area and you can see uh, where it's located, um, the Northern uh, part of these ridges, uh, Chestnut Ridge and Laurel Hill here, this is uh, a low fold, those are upward folds. This is a downward fold in between that includes Ligonier and Ohio Pile uh, along the Okagany River. So here we are, the folds are dying out to the north and the Konama River cuts through the folds in this area. So that was an important feature of, uh, of this uh, special area. And we'll look at that in a bit more detail. So just a big picture context then. So here we are, a closer view with an elevation map. I mentioned Chestnut Ridge, Laurel Hill, and this is the Allegheny Front, uh, the boundary between the plateau and the intensely deformed fold belt with the Valley and Ridge or Ridge and Valley province. It's also Allegheny Mountain. Um, and these are the rides that we'll be talking about uh, in, in uh, the rest of the talk here in this uh, Connemaw Uplands theme. A little bit uh, uh, about what's special here. The Allegheny Front you see is pretty smooth here. It's an important barrier, a major barrier to early um, transportation from uh, between the east and the west here. But you can see to the north around Hollidaysburg and Altoona, there's some gaps that have been eroded by streams into the Allegheny Front. And the front itself is a bit lower, just like Laurel Hill and Chestnut Ridge are becoming lower to the north. And here's the Connemaw River that cut through and provided a pathway for transportation. So it's a special area because it's a transition between the plateau and the fold belt, the high part of the plateau. And then from north to south, it's a, a transition from the larger folds and higher ridges and uh, lower amplitude folds and lower ridges. So it's a very special corner of the world. Here's a closer view. Um, in stars are the towns uh, at the ends of our rides. Um, so on the Hootabog, we'll ride from Black Lick up to Indiana and back. The Ghost Town Trail, as I mentioned, is a long trail. We're going to ride the middle part of that from Dilltown to Nantiglo and back. Nantiglo being a great Welsh name. Uh, and then Path of the Flood Trail will cycle from South Fork to Johnstown. And then the plan right now, at least, is to uh, shuttle back to the vehicles at South Fork. 
Here's a simplified geologic map of Pennsylvania um, showing ages of uh, major ages of rocks from Permian, uh, younger rocks, still hundreds of thousands or hundreds of millions of years old through Pennsylvanian, older rocks, Mississippian, even older rocks, Devonian in the plateau area. This is that Allegheny front separating the plateau from the intensely folded fold belt. And those folds have brought older rock layers, older sedimentary rock layers up to the surface. I'll also point out um, these are uh, sedimentary basins that opened up after the mountain belt was largely worn down. So it's younger than the mountain belt um, and uh, younger than the really old rocks uh, outside of those basins. So notice here that there are Mississippian age rocks that end right around uh, the Connemaw River um, where those folds are losing amplitude and becoming lower relief. But there are some older rocks in the cores of those folds and even Devonian rocks right here where the river cuts through the heart of that fold. Indiana County, uh, um, here where the Hootlebug Trail is, um, was formed in the early 1800s. It has a shape a lot like the state of Indiana, but they're both named for having been Indian territory. I don't think one was named after another, but they certainly have a similarity in shape and were formed and named at about the same time. Cambria County uh, to, the, to the east here uh, was formed about the same time in 1807. And Cambria is named for the Latin word for Wales. And a lot of the early settlers in this area were from Wales. Both areas had coal mines or had lots of mines in them. So a lot of people from Wales came to Cambria, uh, which was a mining region. This is a view of the uh, Kiski and uh, Connemaw watershed. Um, you can see the rivers and the major streams highlighted in blue here. You can see the ride area outlines on Tulick Creek, Creek here, Blacklick Creek, and then the Little Connemaw River, or Little Connemaw uh, yeah, River in this area. And then the same outline for uh, bedrock geology, the colors being different layers of sedimentary rock. Um, most of these layers are of uh, Pennsylvanian in age, an age that includes coals. And we'll talk about that in, in some more detail. But here are those upward folds, uh, Chestnut Ridge and Laurel Hill. And you can see that on the crests of those, erosion has cut down into older rock layers. The blues here are rock layers of Mississippian age, a little bit older. Same thing along the Allegheny Front. Uh, as you go down the Allegheny Front, you're, you're uh, exposing older and older rock layers. And here there are Mississippian rock layers on the edge. Where the Connemaw River cuts through um, Laurel Hill and the upward fold there, in the very core of that gorge are some rocks of Devonian age exposed at the surface. So Devonian bedrock there, but otherwise lots of Mississippian and Pennsylvanian bedrock, especially Pennsylvanian. Oh, and also notice that there are folds expressed in the geology here out on the plateau, but they're lower relief and uh, uh, br uh, broad folds. Now let's talk about uh, the Pennsylvania Canal and coal mining, which was a major theme of this area. We'll start with the canal and a big picture view of major canals in Northeastern America in the 1800s. I've highlighted some of the earliest canals there was a, canal, a short canal up in Montreal that was finished in 1825. The Long Erie Canal was finished at the same time up in upstate New York. Um, the Lehigh Canal was built as a, a, a private initiative um, and it was finished in 1829. The CNO in 1831. Um, the uh, Ohio and Erie Canal connected the Ohio River with Lake Erie in 1833. And the Pennsylvania Canal main line connecting Philadelphia with Pittsburgh was finished in 1834. The long Wabash and Erie Canal uh, between Toledo and Evansville uh, in 1843. Now, um, the motivation for uh, building uh, several of these canals uh, near the East Coast was uh, to connect uh, East Coast cities and populations with interior resources. Um, these East Coast cities, which is where most Americans were uh, at about 1800, 
um, most of the population was in those coastal cities. They had a, a use for coal. Uh, coal was used in working iron. It was used by back blacksmiths and coal was coming from Britain. Um, but the War of 1812 put a stop to that temporarily and caused people to turn toward more local sources of coal, even if the nature of the coals were different to adapt to these different local uh, coals and to come up with uh, ideas for uh, getting those coal resources to the coastal area where the population was using canals. So the Lehigh Canal, that was a big motivation for that. Um, the CNO Canal, much of the freight on those uh, early on was coal. Um, the Pennsylvania Mainline Canal had that purpose too, but also connecting Philadelphia with Pittsburgh, a big purpose there also was to uh, transport manufactured goods and people from Philadelphia uh, to the river system that led west. Um, so that was an important uh, transit point uh, for that too. And you can see there's a big blank area in the middle of this map where there just weren't that sort of freight connection aside from the Erie Canal and the Pennsylvania Mainline Canal. The other feature of this map, uh, the canals being shown in orange, but um, the white uh, lines indicate early portage railroads. So railroads that carried canal boats on railroad cars between canals. And part of the Pennsylvania Main Line uh, had that, but part of it here also had it. And this will be a big focus for us because that's in the area of these bike trails. And the, the fact that uh, this was able to work um, helped give gave people confidence that they could do things like connect the canal along the Lehigh River here with a canal on this part of the Susquehanna uh, through an upland area. So they saw that this actually was working, was happening, and had confidence uh, to attempt that uh, to cross another upland area. And uh, many of these trails, uh, Many of you will know them. The Sino Canal is towpath is a very popular bike trail. It uh, links up in Cumberland with the Great Allegheny Passage, a rail trail uh, that goes to Pittsburgh. Uh, the Delaware and Lehigh Canal is a very popular and beautiful uh, bike trail in, in uh, eastern Pennsylvania area. Uh, the uh, Ohio and Erie Canal, the, the, there's the Ohio to Erie Trail all across Ohio. Uh, uh, the Erie Canal has a bike path along much of it. Um, so a lot of these have become long distance uh, bike paths. And of course there are bike paths along the parts of the Pennsylvania Canal main line too. The, I mentioned the dates on these are approximate completion dates. Uh, for many of these, some segments, segments were finished before the completion of the whole, whole canal and uh, uh, may have earlier dates when they were used than these dates shown. And also some of these canals, uh, they're sort of in a perpetual state of construction and expansion, but these are a typical uh, date to, that people use for them. Let's zoom in on Pennsylvania then and the Pennsylvania Canal. And this map shows uh, the canal system in blue and then in black uh, are the portage railroads that were part of the canal system in the 1800s. Uh, the lettering on the map is important. The larger font indicates Pennsylvania canals. Um, and then the lighter font or the smaller font indicates canal that were, canals that were built by private interests like the Lehigh Canal that I mentioned earlier. So the Pennsylvania Canal then has all these divisions with the bolder, larger font names. Um, and this is a part of the main line of the Pennsylvania Canal. As I mentioned, the Portage Railroad part went from Hollidaysburg to Johnstown. And here's some artwork on the left uh, to illustrate uh, components of the Allegheny Portage Railroad. Um, the uh, canal boats were um, in sections. So there were two uh, sections for this canal boat, each on a different car. Um, it's being pulled up the hill with a rope uh, and the power is coming from a steam engine. So coal would have been an important resource uh, to uh, operate this railroad here in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s. Um, you'll notice this, that was to stop the car from going back because the ropes uh, sometimes failed. Uh, late in the usage of this uh, Portage Railroad, they did start using uh, uh, iron uh, cable instead of rope 
uh, rope was about two and a quarter inches in diameter, uh, but the, it wasn't totally reliable. Also notice there aren't cross ties here like we saw on modern railroad tracks. These are sleepers and we'll talk a bit about those later. Now this um, canal went down to uh, the Allegheny River Valley. It crossed the Allegheny River uh, around Freeport, the mouth of the Kiskey River here. Uh, went along the uh, western side of the Allegheny and then it crossed the Allegheny again at Pittsburgh uh, to go into town. And here's a painting from the 1830s of that crossing. This is a, a look from Pittsburgh up the Allegheny River. And here you can see an aqueduct. It's a wooden bridge carrying a trough of canal water which, uh, in which uh, canal boats would float across and above the Allegheny River, uh, connecting the North Shore with what's now downtown. And uh, the end of the uh, bridge on this side is about the upstream end of the convention center in downtown Pittsburgh today. So the engineering that went into all of these was just amazing. Uh, the mainline canal reduced travel time from Philadelphia to Pittsburgh by quite a bit. Let's look at uh, what made it possible for early transportation to cross the high plateau in this area. I mentioned that um, the elevations and the height of the folds here uh, were decreasing. Um, so that was a part of the reason you could get across here. But specifically, you can see how smooth the edge of the Allegheny Front is here without breaks for a while. And here's some gaps that streams have cut into uh, the little bit lower part of the Allegheny Front or Allegheny Mountain. Um, and you can see Blair's Gap is where the Portage uh, Railroad went through um, initially. And then uh, Burgoon Gap and Sugar Run Gap were used by the um, Pennsylvania Railroad later on, which uh, approached the Allegheny Front from Altoona, where the, um, uh, the uh, canal approached uh, the Allegheny Front from Hollidaysburg. So those are the three gaps that you'll see later associated with transportation across this major barrier. Then uh, these ridges were major barriers too. And you can see that the Connemaw River has uh, cut through uh, Laurel Hill here and made Connemaw Gorge. And then uh, there's a gorge as well cutting through this part of Chestnut Ridge. So uh, those were important uh, uh, features, landscape features that were used by uh, early and, and actually current transportation too to get through this area. Okay, um, now you can see the, the ride outlines again. And this one shows um, the routes of the original Portage Railroad from Hollidaysburg up through Blair's Gap. And then from Altoona, later on, the Pennsylvania Railroad Main Line uh, started up the Allegheny Front. This is famous Horseshoe Bend near Altoona. And then uh, went up a second gap over here. And eventually they came into a stream valley and followed more or less the same route um, down these streams and then rivers here down to Johnstown, and then through the gap in the um, Laurel Hill, the Connemaw River created. But when they came to the low plateau, the um, canal, as I mentioned, followed down the um, Connemaw River, uh, down the Kiskey River to the Allegheny crossed, and then crossed again at uh, Pittsburgh after it uh, went down the west side of the Allegheny. But the railroad, when it came down to the low plateau here, went a different way. It went to the south and then to the west uh, through Greensburg. So it took a different route once it got down on the low plateau. Okay, now let's talk about coal. And uh, coal fields uh, are extensive through Appalachia. We're gonna focus on this map of Pennsylvania, but coals extend into adjacent West Virginia, Ohio, Kentucky, um, and there are lots of coals in other states too. The uh, inset box shows a coal that's right next to the Ghost Town Trail near Tw Twin Rocks. And it's, it's a couple feet thick or so. It's the black layer in the middle, highly fractured. Um, there's sandstone ledge above. There's a soft gray shale below it. Um, those shales are typically uh, an ancient soil that was formed below the peat swamp uh, that accumulated organic matter that once it was buried uh, became coal. 
So uh, one of the thin sandstones, uh, there are many of those in the Cambria County area. Um, the map shows colors for grades of coal. I mentioned that in Eastern Pennsylvania, uh, the rocks at the surface today were once buried a lot more deeply than the rocks in Western Pennsylvania. And uh, here, coals of uh, about the same age as the coals over here um, uh, were buried so deeply that they turned into a metamorphic rock, into anthracite coal, uh, which had a, a use. Um, it was popular to use with uh, steam engines, for example, and steamships uh, for heating. The, this orange color indicates low volatile bituminous coal. Um, this is medium volatile. And then this part of the coal fields was high volatile bituminous coal. So burial uh, depth and pressure and heat through a long period of time drove out a lot of the volatile compounds from the coal in this area uh, that was then uh, mined and uh, subject of, uh, of this part of the talk. So it was a low volatile bituminous coal because it was buried more deeply than the area to the west. And um, the Pittsburgh coal was the most important coal in the region. It's a big topic of the plateau talk. I'll just show one slide here about the Pittsburgh coal. The colors here indicate extent of the Pittsburgh coal from uh, Pittsburgh here. Uh, this is uh, Mount Washington across the river from Pittsburgh. It was first mined there in the mid 1700s and is still mined. And the areas that are mined out are indicated with red on this map. And then the, the gray here indicates where the Pittsburgh coal is present. It's thick, it's good quality, but uh, it hasn't, hasn't been mined. Um, and you can see that there's no, uh, very little Pittsburgh coal in our area of interest. There's a little patch here in Cambria. There's a little bit in Indiana County. Um, so there, there was and is coal mining here, but it's mining of younger rock layers than this thick regionally persistent uh, in southwestern Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh coal. Pittsburgh coal was six feet thick here over a huge area, and it got to be even thicker than that uh, to the east. But not much of that in our area. The older coals that are at the surface here, um, and again, the Pittsburgh coal was eroded away. Uh, uh, the older rock layers that are preserved and are at the surface and near the surface and were mined uh, typically have coals that are thinner than six feet. Uh, typical thickness might be three and a half feet for a coal that was mined. Coals that were a lot thinner than that, one or two feet thick, might not have been mined, at least not with uh, underground mines. Um, and sometimes there were coals uh, in places thicker than three and a half feet, but uh, that thickness wasn't very extensive, wasn't as extensive as this hugely extensive uh, Pittsburgh coal where it was present and preserved. Okay, so the, um, this is a, a geologic section of um, some of the sedimentary rock layers that are at the surface in our area. Um, the patterns here, the stippled pattern of sandstones, the dashes are clay rich shales. Um, the brick pattern is limestone and the black bands are coals. Here's the Pittsburgh coal, which is only present in a small part of this area. As I mentioned, it's been eroded away and, and there are older rocks at the surface in most of the area. And the three main coals that were mined in this, in this area we're talking about are the Catanning and Freeport coals. Um, being low volatile, sometimes they were called smokeless coals. One of the mines was named the smokeless mine because uh, you know, it gave off less smoke when it was burned. The composition of this um, wasn't ideal for making coke used in steel making, but it was uh, uh, fit for use as uh, fuel for heating. Uh, so for use in steam engines, for example, or later on for electricity generation. So a heating coal, not a coke making coal. This is, uh, these maps show the outline of the Kiski Kanama watershed. You can see the streams here. There's Johnstown, uh, there's Indiana uh, for reference. And you can see the county boundaries, Indiana County and Cambria County on both of these maps. And this map on the left shows mined out areas. So even though there were older, thinner coals over uh, uh, most of this area than the Pittsburgh coal, still there was extensive mining uh, throughout this region. And the next slide, we're gonna focus in on a box here with a pretty detailed geologic map 
right along Black Lick Creek, um, including the town of Vintondale, Vinton the town of Nantigloa, which are both along the Ghost Town Trail. Here's that map. Um, there's uh, uh, Vintondale here. There's Nantiglo, a uh, good Welsh name. Um, you can see the Black Lick Creek here. And this is a geologic map. So the colors here of the background indicate uh, different rock layers. So the greenish bluish color here is a younger rock layer than the lighter color is an older sedimentary rock layer. The boundary between those is about the level of the lower Catanning coal, which was the main coal mined in this area. Um, the other features of the map, the um, tan lines here, the light brown lines, uh, that's a topographic map. So those are lines of the ground elevation. Um, this is uh, Laurel Hill. So the top of Laurel Hill up here, and then you go downhill and there are streams that come down into Black Lick Creek as you lose elevation. And then you climb up elevation on the other side. The other feature of this map is the gray lines. And those are the same type of a map, except it's the elevation of the uh, lower containing coal. Uh, and the contour interval on those is 50 feet apart. So here, the lower containing coal is 50 feet structurally or in elevation lower than here, rises up another 50 feet, another 50 feet, until you come to the top of a fold. So this is a broad fold. That's the upward fold that uh, is reflected at the surface as uh, Laurel Hill. And you can see that the number of contours going up on that fold decreases in this direction. So you can see that we're losing amplitude on that fold right around this area, right through this area. Um, this is the axis of a low part of a fold. Um, and uh, on the maps, you can also see where there are these uh, um, crossed tool symbols. Those were mine entrances. So the the coal here, the lower Catanning, was first surface mined uh, right along the outcrops, along the stream valley edges here. And then it was mined back into the subsurface. There's a mine portal uh, for one of the mines that went back into the subsurface here. This is the mine number six portal near Vittendale. Uh, we'll see a bit more about that. And those mines lined the sides of this valley, just as the outcrop of the coal lined the sides of the valley here. The uh, railroad line here is the one that has turned into the Ghost Town Trail. So as you can see, the Ghost Town Trail goes right past the mine number six portal and connects up these towns, which uh, some of which are now ghost towns. Here's a map of mines uh, at one stage in their development. Um, uh, just, just a couple of the mines that are in this area, not all of them are represented by these inset maps. So here, here's a mine map from around the town of Wayram and Vintondale. And you can see that there are uh, uh, long areas that were mined. There were a lot of pillars left behind. And the typical mining uh, method was a room and pillar mine, a uh, very labor intensive uh, mining method, leaving these pillars behind with crossing passageways that have been mined out for coal. This is an early, and I think the earliest example of long wall mining. In this map, the white areas have coal still remaining, and the cross-hatched cross dark areas, coal has been removed by long wall mining, where you're taking out a whole long wall of coal all at the same time, and you're not leaving pillars behind you. So that's a long wall mining technique that was uh, more amenable to uh, mechanized uh, and uh, lower cost per unit coal mining and uh, long wall mining is a technique still used today. So here was a very early example of it right here uh, near Vintendale. This is a map uh, that explains the long wall technique they were using uh, from 1911. Okay, this is the site of the mine number six portal. Um, and the Vinton Colliery near Vintondale. And it's part of the Miner's Memorial right next to the Ghost Town Trail. You can see this from the trail. It's part of an AMD and art park. AMD meaning acid mine drainage um, and art. 
And uh, there's a mitigation of acid mine drainage in this area. It's right around the park, part of the park. Um, but also they've incorporated elements of art uh, and, and uh, interpreting the history of the area. So this, this art installation is only one of the artworks that's part of this really innovative park. Um, the images uh, on this black stone that are etched into it are based on images from a home movie of a shift change at the number six portal in 1938. So this artwork is based on actual images and it's really, uh, it's really impactful to see this in person. Um, it's, a, it's really a, a very interesting artwork. And here's an actual photo of the same portal, mine number six portal. You can see the miners, the animals that uh, pulled the coal out um, and uh, the actual portal. So part of that art park is right there. A little bit more about coal mining. Um, there were strikes, labor actions, uh, strife in this area between mines and management um, as there were in, in a lot of coal mining areas in the late 1800s, early 1900s. There also unfortunately were mine disasters in this area too. Um, for example, near Johnstown, the rolling mill mine in 1902, there was an explosion. Um, after the explosion, there were toxic gases in the mine. Uh, the surviving miners who survived the explosion had to find their way miles through passageways of coal mine to uh, another portal to exit. And uh, most of the 112 miners who were lost were actually lost not by the explosion, but uh, later. Um, and some of them actually were rescuers who went in uh, to try to help. So 112 miners lost there. Uh, there were other disasters in the region and in the area. For example, at the Dar Mine in Westmoreland County along the Great Allegheny Passage, um, there's a memorial for the disaster there. There were 239 men and boys killed in December of 1907. That was a really bad month, the worst month for mining deaths in US history, more than 3,000 miners died that month, including the 239 at the Dar Mine. And by the way, some of the miners killed in the Dar Mine had been in a, a mine accident, a different mine just previously, and had survived that um, only to uh, die at Dar. Um, so <clears throat> a legacy of that was uh, after that, especially after that really bad month, but after a all this accumulated uh, toll on people, uh, there was a clamor to make things safer. And the US Bureau of Mines was established a few years after 1907. And that included uh, the Pittsburgh Research Center uh, where the focus was to develop safer equipment and practices. For example, um, it's thought that a cause or the cause of the explosion at the rolling mill mine disaster was that someone was using uh, an uncovered, unprotected uh, flame lamp, headlamp on their helmet so that they could see better. Uh, if it was protected, they couldn't see as well in a part of the mine where that wasn't supposed to be permitted, causing an explosion. And the research center helped to develop safer equipment, uh, lights that would be equally bright, but much safer. Um, and uh, for example, they established that um, methane gas, uh, although it could cause explosions, wasn't necessary to cause explosions, that coal dust alone could cause explosions, which would be important to know in thinking about how to operate a mine safely. So a lot of uh, safety contributions were made there, although even today, mine safety isn't uh, perfectly safe. The image on the right is a mural painted in the back of the St. Nicholas Croatian Church in Millvale, north of Pittsburgh, along the Allegheny River. Um, it's uh, uh, painted by uh, Croatian artist Max Ovanka in 1937. It's very large, right on the back wall. It's one of many really impactful paintings, many with figures much larger than life. A really impactful series of paintings in the church. And I encourage you, if you haven't seen them, to go have a look. Um, there's a society that's preserving these, conserving them. They're well illuminated, most of them. Uh, thanks to the society's work and the many uh, donors who've contributed toward that. So this particular mural along the back wall uh, was painted after 
Vanka had visited Johnstown. And when he visited Johnstown and before he painted this in 1937, he surely heard about the rolling mine disaster of 1902 and was influenced by that. So in this painting, we see a Croatian mother grieving over her uh, son who was lost in a coal mining accident. You can tell that he's a miner. In the foreground, you can see his hard hat and uh, lamp, his lunch pail and his pick, the tools of the trade. He's lying on a newspaper um, and the translation of the headline here is immigrant mothers gave their sons to build American industry. In the background, you can see industry in, uh, as in Johnstown, a, a colliery, uh, a blast furnace. And here are miners either uh, going off to uh, try to rescue uh, those still trapped in the mine disaster or maybe going back to work. Um, so there certainly were uh, was plenty of uh, examples to draw from in creating uh, this art. In the rolling mill mine disaster itself, I think 84 of the 112 miners were immigrants. And of the 84, at least 12, as I understand it, were uh, Croatian. So there were many Croatians, unfortunately, lost here along with others. Um, and there were uh, stories of multiple family members being lost in some of these mine disasters too. And as I mentioned, some of the 112 were uh, miners who went back into the mine to try to rescue people, but unfortunately were lost. So a very impactful mural. Um, let's talk about another legacy of uh, coal mining. Um, the picture here is South Branch of uh, Black Lake Creek, um, right from the Ghost Town Trail. And there's a pile of mine waste you can see here. Um, the, on the left, on the right is the uh, uh, Google 3D image of it. You can see 200 feet for scale down at the bottom. Ghost Town Trail here goes right by it. Here's the creek. And um, this is the waste rock. So it's, it's the shale and sandstone bits and uh, uh, coaly shales um, uh, that came out along with the coal with the mining and, and were separated. Um, and uh, when rain falls on these and water percolates down through them, um, it can dissolve uh, some of the minerals, uh, such as pyrite, iron sulfide, and create acidic, iron-rich waters that seep out of the base of this pile. It doesn't happen always with these, but it can happen with these. The same kind of thing can create acid mine drainage from mines. If a mine is abandoned, fills up with water, um, the water can dissolve those same minerals, uh, pyrite and other minerals, and um, if the hydrology is such that the mine water comes to the surface as a sort of a spring, it's, it can be acid mine drainage coming out of that coal mine um, with a very low pH, very acidic uh, and uh, high iron content. When it hits the air, um, iron, starts, iron oxide starts to precipitate, the pH drops um, and uh, you can have streams that are coated with orange iron oxide. You can see a little bit of that here, not a whole lot. Uh, we'll see a picture that's a, a better example of that. So that's the origin of acid mine drainage, mostly coming from coal mines, but it can come from coal mine waste rock like this. Now, these are streams in the region affected by acid mine drainage. It's a theme all through Appalachia. Um, and you can see, including in our area, including along Black Lake Creek. Here are some pictures from the Ghost Town Trail uh, west of Dilltown. And you can see Black Lake Creek here, see the orange staining from iron oxide. Um, this is a tributary to Black Lake Creek west of Dilltown, Alds Run. A lot of the origin of this water is uh, mine water that comes out in a spring to the surface. And you can see the iron oxide coating the bottom of the rocks here. And this flows as a tributary right into Black Lake Creek. Um, there is mitigation of acid mine drainage in many areas, including some areas along Black Lake Creek here. Um, the typical way to mitigate this is to have a series of settling ponds where the um, iron oxide drops out um, and uh, the pH of the water progressively rises to become more normal and uh, not acidic. So that by the end of going through a series of ponds, uh, the water is okay to go into streams and, and not adversely affect them. So there are some of those in this area, 
but as you can see with Ald's run, uh, not all of the um, not all of the acid drainage has been mitigated in that way. There is hope, though, uh, not only with mitigation, but um, just naturally, often in mines, the uh, <clears throat> the water will run out of minerals to dissolve that it, it can uh, contact and reach. So through time, and it may take 100 years, but some of these mines are 100 years old, through time, uh, the acid mine drainage coming out of a mine can turn into more normal waters, not be acidic. Um, I've seen that in a... Uh, acid mine drainage uh, near where I live um, on Mount Washington in Pittsburgh. Just in the last seven years, there's acid mine drainage that's gone from having an orange stain on the bed like this to being clear water, full of algae and uh, much cleaner water. So it does happen. Um, and it's a known thing about these that happens naturally through time. And as evidence of things improving, on the left is a chart of number of fish species collected downstream of the Kahnemaw and the Kiski River over the last uh, 35 years or so from starting in 1980. You can see there weren't any collected then, uh, 16 collected in 1990 and 2000. And then in 2015, a greater diversity of fish were found in the river. So a good sign of improving water quality in the river, uh, thanks I'm sure to mitigation of acid mine drainage, but also some of the natural uh, mitigation too. And then even with uh, rainwater, um, there's less acid rain now than there used to be. And a lot of the origin of acid rain, not all of it, but a lot of the origin of it is from burning coal uh, in industry and for generating electricity. And of course, coal, there were a lot of coal mines in Appalachia um, and a lot of industry and electricity generation used coal, but there were coal mines in other parts of the country too. In Wyoming, for example, um, in East Texas, in Alabama and Illinois, um, lots of areas here had coal mines um, and uh, used coal. And with uh, air quality improvements uh, since then, you can see that the pH of rainwater has actually uh, gone toward closer to uh, a neutral pH is seven. Uh, so the pH has actually um, um, increased and the rainwater itself has become less acidic. So there is hope. Now let's turn our attention to the Johnstown flood in uh, 1889, when more than 2,000 people were killed in that May. Uh, the South Fork Dam failed after some very heavy rains, uh, flooding the uh, Little Connemaw River Valley, including much of Johnstown. There are a lot of stories associated with this, uh, both stories of heroism and horrific stories. And I encourage you, if you haven't already, to take a look at the book, The Johnstown Flood, written by Pittsburgh native author, David McCullough. It came out in 1968. Um, he was thinking, should I teach? Should I write? He wrote this history book. It's just a really great book. And he decided after the success of that and the, the favorable public reception that he would do a bunch more writing. And he has a lot of beloved history books uh, to his credit since then. So the Johnstown Flood is a good book with lots of stories. The color, uh, illustration, uh, contemporary art from the disaster. Uh, it shows Johnstown. Uh, it shows a stone bridge that withheld the uh, uh, force of the uh, uh, flood. Uh, the front of the flood was full of debris, uh, everything it had picked up along the way. Um, whole houses, pieces of houses, pieces of buildings, um, all sorts of things. It, it encountered a, a manufacturing plant for barbed wire. There were miles of barbed wire uh, twisted up in this thing. All this debris caught on the stone bridge and eventually it caught fire. And that's the subject of this um, picture. There are photographs uh, in the lower part here. Uh, here's a house that had uh, six people in it when the flood hit and they all survived. Uh, and here's a part of Johnstown where a church survived, maybe providing a symbol of hope for some people. The uh, South Fork Dam held back Connemaw Lake, and it's the dam that failed and the lake that spilled into the valley, created the flood. The dam was built starting in 1838 by the state to serve the Pennsylvania Canal. Uh, when the canal ceased operations in 1854, 
the Pennsylvania Railroad bought the canal assets, including South Fork Dam at Carnival Lake. And uh, it was sold through, I think, a series of private interests, including a politician, um, so that by 1880, the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club purchased the rights to the dam and the lake. And they turned them into a, a very exclusive resort. Um, the dam or the uh, hunting club members included 50 extremely wealthy men from the steel, coal, and railroad industries in the region, names that you would recognize. Uh, Henry Clay Frick, for one, was a founding member of this. Um, it included a couple of uh, members, Knox and Reed, who were attorneys. Their firm, Knox and Reed, successfully defended the club in litigation after this disaster. Uh, some of the things that the club had done, uh, they lowered the crest of the dam by three feet so that the crest could be wide enough to, for carriages to cross it. Uh, they put a fish screen on one of the um, overflows, uh, which was clogged with debris that couldn't be removed uh, as the waters rose before the dam broke. Um, and the water overspilled the top of the dam and eroded it away. Um, there had been inadequate repairs done to the dam before they owned it, but they also did some things that uh, many people think contributed to the disaster. So that law firm successfully defended the club. They weren't found to be responsible for the flood. So the club didn't have to pay uh, damages, uh, and there were, which were so many uh, and so deep uh, with this. And uh, Knox and Reed is still around. It's turned into the law firm of Reed Smith, LLP, which many people will know. So some contributions to the region, the nation, and beyond. Um, it's a special place at the northern end of the high plateau, between the low plateau and, and the fold belt, with routes of uh, early transportation, Pennsylvania Canal and Pennsylvania Railroad coming right through here. It has the nation's first railroad tunnel. The Staple Bend Tunnel uh, was the country's first railroad tunnel that was along that Portage Railroad. And that uh, Portage Railroad demonstrated the feasibility of crossing that big transportation barrier, the Allegheny Front. And again, the Pennsylvania Railroad came through this area, but it was an example for other areas too. There's a lot of resource uh, with value added to it here. Um, a lot of energy resources supplied from this region to the area and the country, and also manufacturing. Uh, steel from Johnstown was known to have especially good qualities. Uh, those were important to the growing nation in the 1800s. There's a legacy of coal mining. Early longwall mining was demonstrated here, and there was a contribution made uh, uh, through a lot of strife and, and uh, blood to organized labor and increased mine safety. And that art installation is just really exemplary. The Johnstown flood saw the first big mobilization of the American Red Cross who were on site for months after the flood. And it's left behind a legal legacy. After the uh, club was not found responsible for the, um, for the flood, uh, that was caused by the failure of their dam, um, the legal concept of liability started to be used. Instead of previously, as, as people thought about, well, was the club, um, uh, if this is, if this is uh, their dam, did they intentionally cause it to fail? Uh, did they uh, do something to make it fail? Uh, that was the sort of thing that was needed to prove responsibility. Instead, with the concept of liability, um, even if you don't intentionally cause something to happen, um, you can cause it to happen by having uh, omitted or having not done something that you should have been doing, not, not, uh, not doing what you should to protect others. Uh, for example, so if, if you own a dam, it's not enough to say, well, I didn't know it was going to fail. I didn't think it was going to fail. Um, I didn't intend it to fail, <laughs> uh, but uh, if it could endanger others' lives, it would be important for you to inspect it properly with experts, make sure it's going to keep the other people safe and do proper maintenance to keep others safe too. Otherwise, if you don't do those things and it fails, then you could still be held liable even though you didn't, you didn't uh, uh, intentionally 
cause it to fail. Uh, it wasn't your intent. So the, this concept of liability is it's in our daily lives now. It's firmly embedded in, uh, in the way we think about things and do things and causes people uh, maybe to be more proactive as a responsible party as a result. So that's a, a legacy of the Johnstown Front. Let's talk quickly about the trails. Uh, the path of the flood trail, it's shown in green on this map from around South Fork down to Johnstown. And uh, where it's a solid green line, it's on a road, dashed green line, it's a trail. Here you can see at Mineral Point, it goes on the road again. Then a trail, it goes by the Staple Bend Tunnel that served the Portage Railroad, the oldest railroad tunnel in the US. Um, and parts of this trail aren't a rail trail uh, per se. Um, uh, it's not really a complete uh, uh, smooth, <laughs> flat rail trail. There are parts that are really more amenable to a mountain bike. And for all of these trails, uh, it's really best to do a, an online search on the name of the trail, and you'll find lots of details about the, the nature of the surface of the trail and, and things like that. So this is one that kind of changes character along the way. Here, uh, you're back on the road, going to Johnstown. There's the Johnstown Flood Museum. Here's the Johnstown Flood National Memorial. And from an overlook here, we're looking toward uh, the creek down here. And here's, um, here's the dam that failed. Uh, this is the lake side of the dam. This is the downstream side of it. You can see the, the dam in cross section. And there have been a lot of studies of this, of the engineering of it. I'm not gonna go into all of those. I mentioned some of the things that probably contributed to uh, uh, the flood. Um, here at the uh, Staple Bend Tunnel nearby, there's a, a bit of Portage Railroad displayed. These are uh, sleepers. <clears throat> These are stones in, set into the ground that have two holes in each one. And uh, iron fixture is placed on top. And the holes are filled with an oak plug. And then uh, the, this fixture is nailed into that plug. And the iron rail is laid on top of that. So these didn't work all that well. Um, with freeze-thaw cycles uh, in the spring and in the winter, stones would move a little bit, the rails would move a little bit, one relative to the other. So maintenance was a real headache with this. And uh, nothing like this is used now. Uh, the railroad tracks that you know have cross ties, a much more stable arrangement, but that wasn't the arrangement used in this very early railroad. You can see a steel mill uh, still there in Johnstown. A little, a little bit of the path of the flood trail. <clears throat> Here's uh, the middle section of the ghost town trail, the one that will cycle on the venture outdoors from Dilltown to Manticlo and back. Um, and uh, I'll show a slide uh, on the next slide of the Eliza furnace. We talked about charcoal burning uh, iron furnaces a little more extensively in the talk about the uh, Allegheny River Valley. Um, but I'll have one slide here about the Eliza Furnace. And here's the location of that AMD and Art Park, a really neat feature of this part of the trail. The Eliza Furnace, a lot, right along the Ghost Town Trail, um, operated for only three years in the 1840s, uh, produced 1,000 tons of iron per year then, using local iron ore and limestone, and the fuel was charcoal. Um, furnaces like this consumed an acre of forest per day, which was roasted to charcoal, which was used as uh, the fuel in the furnace. Um, unfortunately, for the people who built and invested in this, the local iron ore just wasn't good quality. It didn't have a high percentage of iron. And it was expensive to transport the iron product down to the Pennsylvania Canal where it could be shipped and sold. Um, remember, this is along Black Lake Creek. Uh, Connemaw River Valley is to the south. Uh, that was where the uh, canal ran. So there's a cost of hauling it there that added uh, to the failure of uh, this after three years. It operated for such a short time, but it's really well preserved, including uh, the metal heat exchanger pipes on top. So this is something that's easy to see. And there are interpretive signs here and other places along these trails that help a lot with understanding the history. The Hoodlebrug Trail goes from, uh, goes from uh, Black Lick Creek to the south uh, to uh, Indiana 
to the north. And it's, it's the root of the Hootabug. The Hootabug was a self-propelled passenger car uh, running on railroad tracks. Here's a sketch of one etched into a stone right next to the trail. In other parts of the country, those were called Doodabugs. Here they were called Hootabugs. Uh, here's the last one in 1940 in the picture. And the trail here is very nice, goes through countryside, goes right along Highway 119 uh, for part of it. There's a varied landscapes next to it. It does uh, go near the big, impressive Homer City coal-fired power plant, which I think is out of operation now. Um, so that's a, that's a feature of this too. And this whole area was really connected to the region through use of resources in uh, not only uh, energy generation here, but uh, um, other industries using coal. And here's an example of that. This is right along the Hootabug Trail. It's a pile of slag. Slag is a waste product of iron and steel making. It, uh, it came out of iron and steel making molten and would be put into special rail cars, uh, taken out to a hill, and then the rail cars would dump this molten material off the side of the hill. It would glow red or orange uh, like lava rolling downhill. And in fact, it's much, it really is an igneous rock. Uh, it's cooled and solidified into a rock, into a slag. You can see the layers of slag uh, as, as it was progressively dumped uh, by uh, one after another train down the hill here next to the trail. Here you can see a piece of slag, lots of bubbles in it. It's just like pumice. It's just like a volcanic rock uh, with lots of gas bubbles uh, frozen in it. This, this part of the slag probably was the base, uh, probably was poured over a cool rock, a cool slag layer underneath. This was chilled quickly. Um, this was uh, uh, chilled in time to catch the bubbles. And here's a feature of this outcrop too, outcrop of slag. There are these polygonal joints. Uh, these look like uh, shrinkage cracks. And I think it's a miniature version of the kind of shrinkage cracks that are preserved and so well displayed in basalts, in igneous rocks that cooled slowly in places like Devil's Post Pile and Giant's Causeway. I think it's a miniature version of, of that sort of uh, shrinkage crack that we see in igneous rocks. So a little geologic feature that you'll pass by along the Hootlebug Trail. So that's what we had for you um, in the Kahnema Uplands uh, geology theme talk. Uh, one of six, uh, third one made. We already have the Allegheny and Ohio River Valleys you can find on YouTube. The Plateau one exists on YouTube as well. And that might be a good one to look at uh, thinking about the Hootlebug Trail as well as uh, the Kahnema theme because it really is, uh, strictly speaking, uh, part of the low plateau. The next one we'll work on is the Laurel Highlands. That'll have a bit more of the geologic reason for uh, the landscape shapes in this area. Um, and we aim to create the other two in the next uh, month or so as well. So I hope you've enjoyed the talk and I hope you're able to get out there. I hope you, on the list of 25 trails, you find some that are new to you and uh, that you're interested in cycling. And I hope to see you out on the trail. Take care.